The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment. Wrestling to the Max SmackDown Review. Hello and welcome to the WWE Smackdown Live review for August 29th, 2017. Of course, this is Wrestling to the Max, and I'm your host Sean Garman. Here with me is Mr. Gary Vaughn. What is up, everyone? Yeah, Harry and Paul and uh, Patrick are... I haven't looked to see if they... I guess I can check, hopefully. I haven't seen it updated yet, but, uh... Yeah, I, yeah. I haven't seen if they, they were supposed to be doing... The reason why Harry is not here is because they were supposed to be doing May Young Classic uh, episodes instead, which is fine. You know, uh, I'm both Gary and I will not be doing next week's uh, SmackDown because we'll be doing something else. Uh, so I guess it's good to give... Uh, Harry, a little break either way, but uh, yeah, this this SmackDown was from my birthplace of Little Rock, Arkansas, and they did not represent very well. I, I wouldn't say the crowd didn't; they were kind of into things as good as they could be, but uh, the 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 wrestling show did not match any of that here. It was. Very, uh, I guess you can call it a lethargic show. Yeah, you know, and that's what happens sometimes in these towns. They don't always get hyped for every single thing that happens, and then you get the towns that it doesn't matter what theme song hits. They're stoked and ready to go, and uh, this yeah. just wasn't that crowd. But, you know, I, I don't know. We'll get into it more, but I'm not sure what SmackDown offered tonight really Well, helped so that's process. what I meant. Like, it wasn't yeah. necessarily the crowd. It was... The show wasn't really helping them at all either. <laughs> yeah, no, so, I mean, I agree. I'm just saying, you have some towns, if they hear Ty Dillinger's music, they're going to freak out like it's WrestleMania. Right, exactly. And it, 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 Ty Dillinger could have got squashed. So, you know, it, this is what you get sometimes. And, uh, you know, uh, we'll talk about it for sure. I mean, this is going to be something that I'm, I'm really kind of curious about bantering with you about this show about because there were some moments I was kind of surprised it didn't hit. Yeah, uh, like you said, it kind of just depends sometimes where they're at, you know, who's kind of being who they care about and stuff like that. Still cared about AJ Styles, as you'd expect, you're in the South. You're going to. uh, That man, you know, made the South pretty much uh, love him from uh, very early on. And that uh, continued here. But, yeah, they started the show. I mean, when you start off the show with Jinder Mahal, uh, that doesn't really set a great tone either. So (laughs) you set off, basically, it was here to eventually set up the, you know, Teddy Long special that you get in the main event. Which is also sort of alluding to the big match that's happening next week. That's a number of contender match between Randy Orton and uh, Shinsuke Nakamura to determine who faces Jinder Mahal. I guess at the whatever the next pay per view is. Which yeah, but we're still in limbo. We don't even on know that. what that is. Yeah. Like, I, I I loved Harry and Paul sitting there working on it for about five minutes last week, trying to figure it out. Like I think it's uh, we do it's just it's sorry we don't know, um, but whatever it is, I, I'm sure I thought it was hell. Was it hell in a cell or? Uh, I don't know. I think this year TLC is going to Raw, so that means that there's going to be another pay per view in the mix here for SmackDown. But I don't well, know. I mean, TLC is Raw, right? Yeah, right now, No Mercy is raw. So I, I 
I, I, I'm kind of dumbfounded on it. I'm not as good as remembering these pay-per-view time spans like Paul you know, or Harry is. So, um, But I think they're still trying to figure that out. I, I don't even know that they know right now. That's so weird that the company doesn't know, but you're going to try to sell tickets to a show, but you don't know uh, what the show is called. Either way, yeah, so Jinder's out here. And he, you know, talks about how he's always disrespected and he should be revered because he's WWE champion. And they're just jealous about how he, you know, is is loved by India. And, and actually these fans here uh, should apologize for that. But speaking of apologies to Sings. You know, Singh Brothers, his uh, cohorts here, they uh, want to apologize to their modern-day Maharaja for what he did last week, for what they did last week, and then they say that they're that sorry they're going to kiss his feet. Uh, Thankfully, he had boot songs. We didn't need to see that. And as they go to do the kissing of the feet. Shinsuke Nakamura's music hits, which seems rather weird because faces are saving heels. Okay. And basically, you know, you get Nakamura beating him up and you get uh, Randy Orton showing up to make the save. Then Rusev comes out. And uh, Jinder hits the Coloss. And uh, yeah, basically, again, like I said, setting up the tag match player for the main event. And let me tell you about this tag match. It was the most just generic tag match you've ever seen for 10 minutes. I mean... I don't know how else to put it. There, just nothing was really happening. I felt like they're just kind of going through the motions. Uh, you know, Nakamura gets the Kinshasa to get the win, and you kind of have Orton and Nakamura look at each other. Orton hits Nakamura with an RKO because he's an ass, and yeah. You know, it's funny, out of all the stuff that took place between these four individuals, the most interesting was the very last moment of SmackDown. (laughs) And that's kind of sad. But like you said, Sean, it's really just kind of, I don't want to say boring, because it's not only boring, but it just fell very flat. I, I think, you know, when they made the start of the show, about Jinder Mahal and, and about the Singh brothers kissing his feet. It, it was okay. Uh, but it, at this point, I'm kind of just annoyed with the Singh brothers. I'm just kind of annoyed at Jinder Mahal's same speech over and over. Mm-hmm. And over again, I, I want something new. Uh, uh, let me tell you how I would book it if I was going to do it. Let him kiss the feet. Let them do that. Don't have the, you know, like you said, you mentioned, you know, the hero saves the heels. That's kind of silly. Why don't you just let them kiss his feet and they get up and feel like, you know, we're so sorry, still apologizing, and then have Ginger hand them something like an American flag napkin to wipe their faces off. Said, this is the only appropriate thing to wipe the dirt off your face with. You know, to really get people pissed, to really get heat, right? I, I think something like that would be important. It would be interesting. We would actually say, oh, wait, this is a great addition to him hating America. All we get right now is verbiage, and it's the same thing over and over again. So I am bored of tears with it. I don't think the Singh brothers did anything great here. I, in fact, them not kissing his feet kind of took something away from me. So that whole opening thing was just This flat. Then the match. It was like you said, just a normal tag team match. Nothing spectacular. No one does anything that wows you. It's just 
going through the motions. I, I just really was bummed out by this because I had this sinking feeling when they opened up SmackDown telling us that this four way was or this uh, tag team match was going to happen. I kind of thought, oh, yay, a very mundane uh, main event. And guess what? They gave me a mundane main event. Very bummed about that. I really am, Sean, interested in the, the last minutes of this whole thing with Randy Orton in that RKO out of nowhere for, you know, Shinsuke Nakamura here. I, I think that that's kind of a fun twist of the story, and I, I think that actually could be something fun to watch. Uh, I feel like that's just setting up so that Nakamura has has a reason to be upset at him, and there's some heat for that match. Which I think is fine. You need that because you don't, you know, Randy Orton's been kind of upset lately. He's, he's not been, uh, you know, happy. I'm just fine with how everything is Randy Orton. And I think that kind of shows that, that this has kind of continued on for him in, this is now freaking me out that. I'm not seeing any. Yeah, I okay. It's working. It's just I wasn't seeing any levels, and I'm like, oh my gosh, <laughs> what's going on here? So, yeah, I, I think that's kind of just continuing this path of like Randy Orton's just been upset about things. Uh, you know, he just he whooped Rusev really quickly. He's he's been kind of angry. So, uh, and I think he wants to let you know Nakamura know, hey. You know, that RKO can come out of nowhere. Don't think we're friends here. I, I want my number one contendership. I want to finally get that title away from gender. Mm-hmm. I really hope we don't go that route, but I could see them to prevent us from getting another singles match between for either one of the two guys. I could see a triple threat happening. A triple threat would be... Okay. I'm more interested in Nakamura and Orton because I know both those have a great work rate. Jinder's what he is. But he's, when he's they're an, both yeah. motivated. Oh, well, yeah, when they're motivated. They it, you know, and that's been the argument for Nakamura for a long time, but I don't think that they want to let the gas, you know, they, they, they don't want him to accelerate. They, they want to keep Nakamura in this certain place not allow him to do too much because they want to have some big matches down the line. And I think they're afraid if they give away too much too early, we won't feel those special matches are actually special. And so it is what it is. But I I think that, you know, in the future we'll get that possibility of Orton versus Nakamura. But I think you're right. Jinder Mahal in the mix. Both of them want that title. The triple threat match is probably a very likely scenario, but I could also see, you know, Nakamura Orton for the number one contendership and then one of them go take on Jinder Mahal, which, you know, is okay too. Um, but, you know, I I just I don't really care about the whole Jinder Mahal thing. And I think it's kind of sad. I'm sitting here trying That's to say. That's what I'm saying. Like, I think yeah. they can kind of protect things by doing a triple threat so that you don't get another. Oh my God! How do we make the another Randy Orton and Jinder Mahal match exciting? And we already kind of saw what you get with Nakamura and Mahal. Do we really need that again? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. at least a triple threat kind of gives you the idea that maybe you can dispose of Mahal for various parts of that match. You can get Orton and Nakamura, and fans will get excited about that. And then Mahal can kind of come in and pin pin one of them or something if they want to keep the title or. You know, uh, maybe Nakamura can pin Orton or or vice versa. And, you know, you can go with that whole well, I never got pinned thing. Whatever they want to do. I just, sadly, I can see them going another freaking month where they keep letting Mahal have the title. It's just so sad that we have to sit here and say, you know, the guy holding the title is the one guy we don't want to see in a main event match. <laughs> it, and it's not that Mahal is an awful wrestler. He's just a very average wrestler, if you ask me. He can do a fine job, but he's nothing special. He doesn't bring anything that's amazing to the table. So I know, so, but when I mean, you're not bringing it on the you're right. I, any I think end, you got to be special at something. Yeah, I mean, 
mean, it's just it, it's about the the crowds over there in India. It, it's about the fact that they've got something going on here that it is about the story and not really about what he brings. And, and when it comes to the actual matches, so I, I don't know. This whole thing, I just think it needs to work out where eventually that title's off him sooner than later. It, it's got. Skype is not not, because of this partly. Skype is not being our friend today. No, it is not. It's got a delay, I think, here. Yeah, we got a delay that you keep cutting out for certain periods. and So th- this is going to be a fun show already. Uh, so <laughs> moving on here, we have... To continue this uh, this very lethargic show, we have the debut of Chad Gable and Shelton Benjamin together as a team against the Ascension. This is one of those times where, look, I understand what you're trying to do with the picture in picture, but it still takes away from the match. Like it's it's still very difficult to kind of pay attention when there's no sound. You're, it's very small. Sometimes you can't really tell what's going on, and you got this big ad going on in front of you. I feel like this is one of those matches. This is their debut as a team. You probably needed to show the whole seven-minute match here. I get what they tried to do. They had the heel heat section during the commercial that was, you know, rather blah. And then kind of set it up to where, oh, we're getting to the hot tag of Shelton. By the time we get back from commercial, that sort of worked. Shelton hit his, like, dragon whip wheel kick thing. He hit the pay dirt. And the face team wins. This also wasn't uh, any kind of match that you need to go back and watch. Yeah, I mean, if you're a Shelton Benjamin fan, this is exciting for you, right? I mean, it's nostalgic. You're excited that he is here, and he has finally got a chance to wrestle in a WWE ring once again. The match itself was what a tag match is in this situation. Uh, It's all about the face team, and the face team doesn't get a squash per se, but pretty close to it. And it makes him look really good, and, and now you walk away really happy that Gable's doing something, and his tag team partner is Shelton Benjamin. If you don't know anything about Shelton Benjamin, you're just kind of like, okay, who is this guy? I want to know who he is. And, wow, okay, Jason Jordan. Yeah, I can see how this guy kind of is a good replacement. And, and I think that's what you got. Out, outside of that, it was just a way to kind of pop the fans, and it's really more for the nostalgic fans, not really for, maybe for the newer fans. Yeah, that's what it's there for. I don't feel like they got the reaction they wanted, but, you know, again, he was a guy that's very known as being one hell of an athlete, did three different sports. He's not a personality guy. So, I mean, in that way, he fits with Chad Gable, but I wonder if this is going to last, and they're not going to just separate him. Mm-hmm. And Chad Gable's going to want to buy himself again. That's what I've heard. Uh, and that's an interesting idea. And I kind of lean more towards that. I think there's a reason they split up, you know, Jason and uh, Jordan and Gable. And I don't well, think that they, they did for that stupid angle that Jordan's doing. And Yeah. But I think there's other reasons, though. I really feel like they want to see what Gable has to do when he's in a singles career, right? I think they want to yeah. find out what they have in him. And they like him. They like him a lot, just like they do Jason Jordan. So I think they're going to get back to that. And why not have him feud with a guy like, you know, his tag team partner currently? You know, Shelton Benjamin is is a great worker, and he'll bring uh, lots of great things to the table against, Jay, you know, uh, excuse me, uh, Gable here. So I, I'd lean towards that. I really do. That that, that kind that's of that's what you're hoping anyway. That they give them time to have really good matches that we know they can have and. Mm. And it turns into something, but we'll see. Yeah. You know, well, you also the, have this, to get the crowd to hate Shelton. You you do, but it won't be very hard because once again, this is a young crowd. They're going to find a way to hate Shelton. 
this marks well the, the, all the fans like us who know Shelton Benjamin. Or will be maybe like, you uh, mm-hmm. do you turn Gable instead? I don't know. I think Gable fits the babyface role better. For me personally, I, I look at him as a guy you want to get behind. It, Shelton Benjamin's been away for so long; it doesn't really matter if you really care about him, like as in a babyface or heel. I think it's easier to turn him rather than a guy like Gable, who I think people just uh, find endearing. But you know, you could do it that way. I'm not arguing that you couldn't change and have Gable be the heel here. I just think it works better the other way around. I'd say if he was, like, using his catchphrase and all that kind of stuff and it was getting over, I'd say yes. But he does have some kind of motivations here for turning if he wanted to. Mm -hmm. So that possibility is out there. Again, look, the Ascension haven't done anything but be comedy for the fashion files and stuff for a while. So I think everybody kind of knew where this was going. It works as a good debut match, just there wasn't uh, much to it again. You have AJ Styles, who of course is uh, has restarted the United States Open Challenge. Uh, Kevin Owens cannot challenge him uh, due to a decision by Shane McMahon. So it is really an open challenge here for the SmackDown roster. Uh, Baron Corbin had come out previously and saying he's blaming John Cena for costing him that money in the bank, and then he ran away to Raw. So you could kind of see where this was going. Ty Dillinger comes out, but Baron Corbin kind of pushes him around and attacks him, which leads to Ty Dillinger being easy pickings for AJ Styles, puts in that calf crusher, and Ty taps out. And uh, then Baron Corbin tries to attack Ty, but AJ, you know, lets him know that ain't happening. He don't want none. And he don't want none of this championship either because he's going to get, he's going to get, you know, beat up. So it seems like we're going towards Corbin and AJ, which is fine, I guess, for Corbin. Just, uh... When Italia makes you the butt of a joke later, that lets you know where Baron <laughs> Corbin is. <laughs> I thought the same thing. Oof, uh, poor Corbin. Someone really does hate him backstage. Um, you know, I, I think this is a definitely an interesting feud because I think you know Baron Corbin is that big blundering heel that you know is powerful bring something to the table, but at the same point is not all that grand. And in AJ Styles defeating him, I think, you know, at least, you know, make something fun, something special, but at the same time, it's not putting AJ and giving it away a bigger match than this. So I, I think it's fine. I, I like Baron Corbin's thought process and everything he said about the fact that, you know, why he deserved to get the U S title and his confidence that he was going to gain it. And, I, to me, it was a very fun thing that they threw Ty Dillinger in here because you really kind of felt like when Ty Dillinger came out, he was in for a butt whooping, in which he got, but it was not right away. Actually, he found himself in the ring and got his match. So I was happy to see that, even though it wasn't really all that fair for him. I was glad at least Dillinger had a match on this episode of SmackDown because it's been a while since I've seen him at least. So there you go, Dillinger. You got some TV time. I think, you know, in the end, though, this works out. It makes AJ look good. It makes Corbin look like, you know, he should look a, a jerk, a heel that really is a threat to AJ, but at the same time just is not, you know, at that point yet where he's going to get in there for that championship title, uh, at least for now. Yeah. Uh, it, we'll have to see. I, I just – I wish they would – have been able to carry out this open challenge thing a little bit more before we already kind of give AJ a storyline. But I guess I get the need to either punish Corbin more or sort of try to right that wrong or whatever it is they're trying to do. I get it. He's a bully and this kind of fits his MO, but 
I don't know. Just I like it when there's an open challenge and it feels like an open challenge. Not that we're going to have Corbin basically taking Owen's spot and bothering AJ all the time. Yeah, and you're not wrong on that. To be honest with you, I, I kind of had that in the back of my mind as well because we just heard John Cena talk about it on Monday Night Raw. You know, he mentioned it. He goes, look, I elevated the U.S. title because I gave young stars an opportunity to come out and face me every week for it. And now AJ was going to get that opportunity, and they're kind of taking that away from him. They're, they're just saying, look, we're going to put you in another big feud. Sorry, I mean, we could feed you a lot of these younger guys, but we're not going to. And that's a big shame because AJ Styles is the one guy in this company, besides maybe a John Cena, that could really expose young talent to the you know the entire WWE universe and give other guys an opportunity to look really good and they really need that in SmackDown they they desperately need that so I think it's a shame it's it's something that they're missing here but I mean this WWE they do what they kind of feel like they want exactly that's what they do uh, so I I forgot to mention that Rusev also wanted to let Jinder Mahal know that he came to SmackDown for the WWE title and that they were not friends. So I appreciate that, at least, that Rusev feels like he has intentions for other things. Speaking of guys with other intentions, Mike Kanellis, we talked about on the Monday show about how he's been battling with uh, substance abuse and has been getting clean and... All of a sudden, now he is a jobber to the glorious Bobby Roode. Uh, the crowd enjoyed singing with Bobby Roode. This match lasted about three minutes. Uh, it's here, like I said, to have Mike Nellis just get squashed. Oh, boy. Uh, not the greatest look for a new guy like Mike Nellis, but at least Bobby Roode got to look good. Yeah, I mean, Rude does kind of come out and give us that really flashy baby face. You know, you you really kind of want to get behind him because that theme music is so much fun. And just the way he works in the ring, it, it just showcases that he's a super awesome talent. That's not really the story here. Uh, I think the biggest story is what you talked about here, Sean, and that is Mike Kanellis is really uh, jobbing out. And Why? And sure, it could be because of his prescription drug addiction. Maybe. Maybe that they're trying to say, we're going to ease you back in before we trust you to keep you around. But I don't know. It, it maybe seems they to... already soured on that gimmick that really felt like it was never going to go anywhere. I mean, the power of love. What the hell was that ever supposed to be? Yeah, you're right. We don't really still know what that's supposed to be. And I don't think they ever got the opportunity to fully showcase it. I think really it was because, well, who's the feature person here? It's definitely not Mike. It's Maria. And they're focusing on her without focusing on her. It's kind of weird, right? They were going to have her use him to do her bidding. And at this point, no one really cares. And no one knows anything about Mike and Ella, so it's hard for them to really buy in. I, I don't know where they go from here. I, I really wish that they would give them an opportunity. What was the whole purpose in signing him to the – SmackDown roster, if they were just going to have them kind of flounder and, and, of course, you know, do these kind of matches, I, I don't think you're using Maria in the right form. I think that there's a reason they hired him. I want to see that reason. Find uh, something else if that's not going to happen. Well, maybe, the thing is, maybe they came in with this idea and it was perhaps better flushed out than the way it was. Mm -hmm. So... You know, maybe they had a better thought process for it, and then the execution was just came out this way. And Vince says, "Look, I, I'm not feeling this. It's not going anywhere." And now they kind of lost faith. And <laughs> you add in the stuff with the outside things, and hopefully he's not being punished for that at all. I mean, we all have to deal with issues and and problems. Um, mm -hmm. so, you know, it is what, it, it is what it is, but that's the thing. Maria's not a wrestler. So if this is his route, what is Maria going to do? That's exactly my point. And 
I, I just have a hard time believing that they're going to continue on with this process the way it is. I think eventually they will give them something, even if it stays in the mid card, that you know makes Mike look better and at least gives her an opportunity to stand up there and use the microphone and and, and be a part of the show more than what she is. Because really, in this one, just kind of a a face out there, just kind of you know. Nobody, uh, not doing anything, just kind of a person standing at ringside. And that didn't help anybody. That didn't make any money. Uh, I think the money really is in her voice and what she's got to say. Um, so I don't know. We'll see. I, I hope good things are going to come from Mike and Ellis. I really do. I hope so uh, as well. Just, I mean, you don't want to see him jobbing after he just signed and everything. That's that's always a awful thing to see, but. I think we said it, you know, what role does he really have? He's not anybody that just stands out, but I guess there's time for that. We'll, we'll have to see if they ever regain faith in him or not. Uh, you do have the Aiden English coming out uh, to do his singing. Kevin Owens interrupts him, tells him, look, I appreciate what you do, but uh, I got to talk some business here. Uh, Owens talks about how he's titleless and that uh, this time last year he was being Universal Champion. Now he can't get even the U.S. title. Stephanie McMahon would have never abused her power. Uh, Then basically Shane comes out, talks about how, hey, you picked a ref that was biased. I was trying to bring balance to that. And that everybody's tired of hearing you moan and groan and complain about this every week. So Aiden English get in the ring because you're wrestling Sami Zayn next. Uh, Aiden English and Sami Zayn have the match. In the middle of it, Owens gets off commentary and decides that uh, he's going to make himself the referee. And then hits... uh, Sami Zayn, his, you know, bitter rival with a pop-up powerbomb, and Aiden English gets that win. And then Shane comes out and removes the win from the record books, and both men apparently leave. So, more build-up to Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon. You know, this actually worked okay for me, to be honest with you. I I was actually... Happy with what they gave us. I think this was something that was a little bit different than usual, right? I mean, you don't usually get a chance to see a wrestler come in there and rep the jersey, rip the jersey off a referee and put it on and do the match himself. You don't see that on a normal basis. I mean, it was funny, but it's just like really mm -hmm. dumb, too. Well, yeah. Okay, so anybody can do this, though. Well, yeah, but that's what I'm saying. Shane stopped it. Shane's like, look, you can't just do that. So now, guess what? You know, no one wins that match. It's not on the books anymore. So I think that that's what, you know, is good about it. They they do address that. And at the same time, do something you don't see every day, which I kind of felt good about. And, and the fact that he really honestly spit in the face of Shane McMahon here by saying, look, I'm going to do what I want. I don't care what you say. I, I think that's good. It's appreciated, especially if they are going to have a feud going forward from here. I think you need those strong moments to really, you know, hold on to. So I'm really happy with what we got here with Kevin Owens and Shane McMahon. And did I really need to see a clean matchup between, you know, Sami Zayn and Aiden English? No, I didn't. I really don't have to see that to be happy. So I think they, you know, really kind of knocked it out of the park when it comes to being one of the better parts of this show. That's kind of sad. When that's it better, is. Better parts of the show, but... Ah, that's the state that SmackDown's in right now, especially mm-hmm. with this show. We have the the match that was promised with the tag teams uh, to basically decide who gets to pick the stipulation for the match at the next pay-per-view. Uh, you have the Usos taken on the Kofi and Biggie version of New Day. It has been revealed that Xavier Wiz is an MCL sprain that takes about a month to heal fully, so he's not going to be out of action very long. Uh, People were fearing the worst. We talked about possibly fearing the worst on the Monday show. Thankfully, it's not uh, that big a deal. 
basically, you know, the New Day had a good role going on. And I loved Kofi using the Dragon Sleeper here, too, as a counter. That was really cool. We don't ever really see that. A uh, very smart counter to that. But then the, the Usos hit the blind tag, and you get a roll-up with some tights being grabbed in the New Day. And now get to decide the stipulation. This is also a match that suffered from the doing the picture-in-picture -picture thing with the commercial. It, I like that they do it, but... I mean, it, that at least you get to see the match, but it's still just really annoying. Yeah, I'm I'm with you, and I didn't really comment on that earlier. Um, but to be honest with you, it doesn't do you any favors. Sure, you can still watch the match, but it's just not the same. It just doesn't feel like anything special. And you know as you watch it, they don't blow you away with what they're doing in that small little screen anyway. So Yeah, you can kind of tell that they're telling him, all right, you're on commercial. Make sure you don't do anything, you know, spectacular or whatever. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, why, why even watch it? I mean, just watch the Downey commercial. <laughs> yeah. So, <exactly>. uh, <laughs> but no, I mean, this is an okay match. It, you know, went a lot faster than I expected. The Usos doing the Usos. And, and of course, you know, once again, making the new day, you know, struggle a little bit here compared to what we're used to seeing them struggle and, and finding a way to win. So I think this is okay. Um, not spectacular uh, to me, honestly, this is kind of just a, a small stepping stone in the story of the Usos versus new day. I don't think it was anything overwhelmingly great. No, it wasn't. It was just a way to further advance the story. Like you said, and that's fine. Uh, but when you put it all together with the wrestling we have gotten on this show, it's just another, we're just running through the paint by numbers mm -hmm. uh, deal here. Uh, you also have then the small portion of the show that's given to the women, about a total of about two or three minutes, really. You have uh, James Ellsworth. Remove Dasha Frentes from the scene so he can introduce Carmella. Carmella's mad at him for uh, last week messing with her plans. And that uh, then Natalia shows up when Carmella's kind of stumbling through and tells Carmella that if you try to cash in on her, I will make you the Baron Corbin of the women's division. Ouch. Mm. Woo. Let me tell you, I'm pretty sure Baron Corbin didn't care for that too much. <laughs> I bet not. And they apparently have a match next week, Natalia. And uh, Carmella and Naomi shows up to remind Natalia that she has her rematch with Natalia in two weeks. So, you know, at least we know what we're doing with the women the next two weeks. Yeah, you got the full slate on the schedule right there in front of you. <laughs> in, in just a, uh, what, a two minute little segment here. And just to finish with the women, Lana is back to being a manager, wearing the suits again. And she basically almost does the introduction like she did for Rusev, except for Tamina. And then you get to hear her do the Tamina crush, which kind of gets Tamina going. She gets that super kick and wins. Nobody cared about this. And... Yeah, this was just really awkward. So that that's your two women segments for the entire show, by the way. Uh, you know, the Natalia segment with Naomi and Carmella, very ho-hum. I just, I, I get it. Yeah, set things up, but I, no one really inspired me. No one really made me feel like I should care. And, and then, of course, this. I mean, I've been kind of looking forward to seeing what they were going to do with Lana and, you know, Tamina. I think that that's something that actually could be fun and interesting and something we could kind of really, you know, want to pay attention to every week on SmackDown. But this was just there. Um, Tamina squashes the girl. I don't even know her name. Um, takes her down. No problem. I, I Yeah. I mean, that's all I have for you. They really don't give you anything else i mean to me no, supposed didn't. to come up yeah to me supposed to look strong she does look strong against someone really if she didn't look strong against maybe they should fire her so there you go it wasn't the greatest like beat down either it was really kind of awkward and uh you also did get 
sort of a mixture of Lana getting to pump Tamina up and also Tamina getting pictures of her taken by photographers and stuff like that to kind of prove that Lana can bring her star power. That's basically what they were trying to do here. And I don't know that it came off that well. Yeah, it, it's hard. And I, I kind of appreciate the idea, though, to be honest with you. Right. I, I do like the idea because, let's be honest, Lana is not going to come out here. They're doing something with Tamina, mm-hmm. you know. Well, and Lana, too. Lana's not going to blow you away with her wrestling. But they can She's... easily put Lana back with Rusev if they want to. Well, and nobody will bat an eye. It, you're right. That that could be the case. But I think they really want to try to get him on his own path without her. And I think that they're trying to use some of her talent as being a manager to help someone like Tamina who desperately needs someone to talk for her. Desperately. So... I get where they're going, and I'm not against it. I'm really not. I just think, you know, they've got to start to kind of heat this thing up to make us care. Find something and a reason to care about all this. And, you know, it is what it is, and I'm not hating on it. I think, actually, Lana and Tamina working together is probably smarter than them not working together. So I'll say, yes, good job on that, but not a great one when it comes to just just squashing people. Who cares? Yeah, uh, it's, uh, that's what they're doing here, and we'll see how they continue it on for next week. Only two things left to talk about here. The Fashion Files have returned for Season 2. Uh, it was named Back to Basics. They have some new technology, and they now have like a black light where they had boxes stacked up each other. They had the files from the previous season. And they kept pointing in the same direction in a circle until Fandango switches it. And it points to the board where it's like just points out a to be or not to be. And so they wonder if Aiden English was the guy that might be at, at fault here. You know, we a lot of talk about Authors of Pain. I still feel like it's going to be them. But the investigation continues, I guess. It does, and you really do wonder if it's the Authors of Pain or who the heck it could be. All I know is I'm still having fun. I, I still yeah. think these guys are hilarious. I love the intro. Oh, man. You, you know, no, I like Sean, that how they have like an it. official intro now. Yeah, I love that feel, that 80s retro cop show. It just feels yeah. so, so good. So I, I'm very happy with this. Um, this probably wasn't my as favorite funny part. as some of the other, like where they did the spoofs and stuff, but... Yeah, but you know what? Honestly, I'm happy they're not just relying on the spoofs. I'm happy that they're doing some things that are kind of funny without having to kind of, you know, go off of another show or something else, right? Um, So, to me, it's really positive. Really happy what we got here, you know, the fashion files, and I'm looking forward to more great content. Oh, of course. They always bring the goods. Hopefully, we'll get to be excited about whatever they do next week. And finally, Dolph Ziggler. Gets interviewed by Dasha Fuentes, and he says that Little Rock, Arkansas, is not good enough to see the new Dolph. So that's going to be next week. But then he kind of shoots on. I don't know if this was sort of half shoot or whatever, but he kind of just goes off on how, you know, for 10 years, he's been the best, but he's got nothing to show for it. And it's because, you know, he's a star, but people just get distracted by a lot of glitz and glamour instead of what he brings to the ring. You know, he could go out there and and be the drifter. He could go and ride four-wheelers and drink beer like Stone Cold. He could put paint on himself like Finn Balor. But uh, that's... If all you want is style and no substance, that's what he'll give you. But it's going to be next week. I get waiting um, because you're hoping that people will be curious and the anticipation will build. And as the anticipation builds, people will start to really care about what Dolph Ziggler is going to do next, right? I don't know I have that same effect. Right now, I'm like, Dolph, we get it. Okay, you can stop talking now. And then he keeps going. It's like him doing one of his comedy routines in a promo or something. Yeah, you're right. That, that probably is the right analogy here because I look at it and say to myself, man, if you would have just stopped five minutes ago and you know let it be, 
I could get behind you in this whole match and whatever you're going to do, your entrance, whatever you're going to bring to the table next, if you weren't just talking and talking and talking. And I just kind of feel like these promos are dragging and they're saying the same thing and he's just finding new ways to say it. I, 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 you know, I hope, you know, for great things for Dolph Ziggler. But right now, even with him being on TV, it's just kind of, ugh, come on, let's move to the next thing. Yeah, it is officially Hell in a Cell, by the way, on October 8th. Okay. So, uh, yeah, that that that's the show. Like I said, this just felt like a lethargic, we're just paint-by-numbers show. Mm-hmm. Uh, I wonder if you would have had something with Becky and Charlotte, but Charlotte's away tending to her father and stuff like that, so that's kind of in limbo. But other than that, you kind of saw everybody, basically, and... Ugh. I don't know. This was not a very fun show to watch. Uh, no. I will give it about a... F- a four? Yeah. You know... Yeah, four's pretty low. Um, there were parts of it that were entertaining to a point, and I, I, I think I'll have to go with what I gave Raw. I gave Raw a five. I'll go with this show a five. I just, it was uninspiring. There were a few things that kind of made me chuckle and laugh and entertain me. Outside of that, though, I mean, really nothing to write home about. I'm still sitting here feeling guilt of why Dolph Ziggler is where he's at in his role and things like that. So I shouldn't mark it down as a four myself, but I'll go five. I think that's a fair assessment and really kind of disappointed what SmackDown gave us this week. Yeah, just really disappointing all around. And, of course, that's going to do it for us talking SmackDown this week. Uh, Be sure to check out Gary and Paul doing the Raw review, which, you know, Gary didn't give you a glowing review there. But still, if you want to hear them talk about it, that's available to you. Uh, We'll be doing 205 live here shortly, or if you're listening on demand, it's already there for you, so you can... Uh, check that out as well. Of course, from the same arena. Just different characters on that show. The debut of Enzo Wrestling. And I don't know if... I still haven't checked to see if there anything's up yet or not. Uh, I don't think it is. But uh, hopefully at some point there is a uh, May Young Classic uh, review from the guys. Don't know when they're going to do it. Of course, these are... They're just releasing shows and batches every four for a couple of weeks, and then you're going to have the final. So it's whenever these guys want to get to it. Uh, I had told them to do it by episode, so that's how it should be. But I don't know. You know, they're the ones that have the ultimate say, obviously, because they're the ones doing this. Uh, But as of right now, as we finish SmackDown, there's nothing here. But, of course, we also have the part one episode where we did talk about Mike uh, Kanellis' rehab, uh, the whole sexy star controversy. So if you want to listen to us discuss that, that's certainly there uh, for you. And, of course, that RH TV review as well. So plenty of stuff for you guys to check out. Make sure you hit that subscribe button if you like what you heard, Wrestling to the Max, or the whole W7 Network where you get you know the football show, soccer show, uh, MMA to the max, where they talked about that big Mayweather and McGregor fight. You get uh, everything we do here. Uh, the Radless Broadcasting Guys, all the entertainment stuff. So definitely a lot to check out there. And until next week, uh, make sure you listen to W10.com. Everywhere you can hear us. Uh, 41 Mania as well. And, of course, uh, last word on ProWrestling.com. So later, everybody. The following podcast is a W2M Network original production. Visit W2Mnet.com for all of our other great podcasts, plus news, reviews, articles, and opinions from the worlds of wrestling, video games, football, and entertainment.